And if you would take your Bible to Daniel, the second chapter, we'll look here in just a moment at Daniel chapter uh, 2, verse 28. And then we are actually going to look at a lot of scriptures again today. And uh, to do that, uh, I'll put most of them up on the screen here, but we'll start out with one, Daniel chapter 2, verse uh, 28. As a matter of fact, just a little uh, part of verse 28, because we are talking about uh, all the mysteries of the Bible. It was a sermon that I started last week. Uh, and uh, I, I'm always an optimist, thinking uh, I can cover so much ground in the uh, short, 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 short time we have for preaching. And uh, I was not able to finish. Uh, as a matter of fact, I left quite a bit of the sermon undone. So we made this a part two. So uh, I want to give just a little bit of a refresher on a biblical mystery and uh, then get into some of the mysteries that we didn't look at in all the mysteries of the Bible. Last week we looked at six of them, and uh, today we'll be looking at a few more than that, but some of them are brief, I promise. And I think we're going to uh, finish this little sermon today. One of these days I am going to make this into a full series so we can dig into each one of these mysteries because there's so much involved in them. But uh, a biblical mystery, remember, as we said last week, a, a, a mystery today is like a, you know, a whodunit, uh, a, 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 a Agatha Christie or a, a NCIS or something like, you know, who's, who's the culprit? That's not a, a biblical mystery. The, the non-biblical mystery, you can kind of research and look for evidence and you can come up with an answer. A biblical mystery requires a revelation from God or you would simply never know it. And so uh, this uh, biblical mystery is what we're going to look at today. Daniel chapter 2 verse 28, and I really I just want to take the first part of this sentence here. Uh, as Daniel says, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. And it's God's revelation of secrets that we are considering last week and this week. And the reason that understanding these mysteries are so important is because a prophecy tells what God is doing in the future. The Word of God tells us what God has done in the past. But these mysteries reveal what God is doing right now. So in order to, uh, to have a biblical worldview, you've got to understand, you know, what is God up, God up to? And you look at these particular mysteries right here. Now, last week, again, we looked at the mystery of the times of the Gentiles, the mystery of the kingdom, the mysteries that really should be of the kingdom, the mystery of the blindness of Israel, the mystery given to Paul, that's the one under which we live, the mystery of Israel's experiences as typology, the mystery of Israel's transformation. Now, with that, we are going to come and look at at uh, uh, some more of these mysteries. Once again, we wouldn't know these had God not revealed them. And as we uh, uh, discussed uh, last week, the, um, the, the, the way I made this list was uh, I looked up the word mystery. <laughs> And uh, every time it said, hey, this is a mystery, I said, okay, I think this is a mystery. And I began to look at those and say, yeah, sure enough, you couldn't go to anywhere in Scripture and sort of build the case for this. It's something that never was known until, boom, right there, God has revealed it. Now it is a mystery. Now, uh, there's, there's one other, and we'll get into this today, uh, one other criteria that I use to discover a mystery, and that is I looked at all the ignorant passages. That is, I do not want you to be ignorant. That is to say, if I don't tell you this, you're going to be ignorant. And so, though the word mystery is not used, uh, there it is, uh, nonetheless. So, with that, uh, let's uh, get into uh, Scripture here, and uh, here we go. Uh, let's uh, walk through uh, today's mysteries the mystery of the fullness of times. And for this, we look to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. Again, I'll put these uh, passages up on the uh, screen just because there's going to be so many of them today. And uh, the mystery of the fullness of times. Uh, Paul says to the Ephesians, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that, that is the mystery of his will, is what? 
it is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. This is a mystery that tells us the day is going to come when all things are going to be under him. Now, both things on heaven and on earth. Uh, things are going to come together under Christ. I think, uh, if you happen to ever watch the news, you probably would agree with me that we're not there yet. We do not live in what the Bible here calls this dispensation of the fullness of times. A dispensation, the word simply uh, means an economy. In fact, the Greek word is oikonomia. The economy of the fullness of times is going to be when all things are one under Christ. Today, there is division. Today, there is the, uh, uh, the, the, the God of this air, the prince of the power of the air, the God of this age. But a day is coming in which all things will come together. And so it's something that, uh, that really all of, uh, all of creation can look forward to, certainly all of mankind can look forward to, when all of this comes together. We also see, we won't go there, but Hebrews chapter 2 verse 8 says, I'm going to paraphrase for you, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 8 says, but right now we do not see all things together under his feet. Uh, it says someday all things will be together under his feet. Right now, we don't see that. Again, you didn't even need scripture to tell you that, did you? You're, uh, you're a smart bunch uh, gathered here today, and you can see, yeah, there's a lot of warfare against Christ. All things are not together under his uh, feet, but someday every person, every principality, every power, every dominion, every force of nature, if you will, will all be brought under his feet and brought un into us. Uh, subjection to Jesus Christ and to the will of Jesus Christ. And so we uh, come forward and we look at that. Now, that sort of begs the question, doesn't it? Like, well, when will this be? When will be the dispensation of the fullness of times? Um, I, I think that if you were to look at this and consider this, you would certainly have to say, well, it is going to take, uh, well, let me, let me, uh, let's, let's just narrow it down, but let's back up a little bit before I get there. If today we were to decide that we wanted, uh, uh, let's just go with the United States. Ah, uh, let's narrow it down to New Mexico. Let's narrow it down to Taos. We want everyone in Taos to live according to biblical morals and values and instruction. All we would need to do is call up the mayor and say, Mayor, uh, we think that everyone in Taos should live according to uh, biblical revelation. He would say, Ah, oh, yes, I think I agree with you. We'll bring it to the town council on Monday night. I'm sure that they would all agree, and we will institute it. Right? Okay, it might not go quite that smooth. Uh, and uh, so... How could we bring it about in our town? Oh, I know, we could, uh, we could have longer preaching, amen? There's a dead silence there for a moment. Uh, uh, we, you know, if we did more preaching, we did more Bible studies, we did more evangelism, we did more gospel sharing, eventually we would, one by one, we would win everyone in the town and in the county, and uh, then we would have this place where all things in Taos, New Mexico, were in Christ, the things in heaven, the things on the earth. If they were in Taos, they were, they were in subjection under him, Right? I think you would agree with me that we, you know, uh, it, it, would be, it would be a noble effort, but I don't think we would accomplish it, do you? Uh, because we do recognize the devil is at work today, there is the forces of evil, there's, there's, uh, there, there's the free will of man, which is not going to bring, you know, there's just going to be one problem after another, after another, after another, and uh, we wouldn't be able to accomplish this. So when is the dispensation of the fullness of times? Is it when we Christians get, finally get our act together and we share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world and the world, you know, the, uh, to, to use the, the words of an old song, uh, we share the gospel of Jesus Christ and the darkness will turn to the dawning and the dawning to noonday bright. Is that, is that the way it's going to work? 
I think you would all agree with me, no, that's not it. The dispensation of the fullness of times is going to happen with warfare, but he is the warrior. He is the warrior who will come, and with the sword of his mouth, his enemies will be destroyed, and he will establish this dispensation of the fullness of times and gather all things together as one under him. So there is the mystery of the fullness of times. Then we go into another interesting one, and uh, this is uh, completely unrelated, but this I will call the mystery of marriage. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses uh, 31 and 32. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined unto his wife, and they uh, two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Now, I want to stop. Uh, let, me, let me get those two verses. Uh, maybe I can get them both on the screen. There we go. Uh, so, two are going to come together and be one. This is a great mystery. Here's a, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the struggles of <coughs> excuse me, biblical interpretation is when you see the word this, you have to say, is it this thing he just said or is it this thing he is about to say? You have to put this together. Here, I think when we did, if we were to do the work together, you would discover that the great mystery is two becoming one. How in the world do you make two become one? He says... It's a great mystery. That is, it is, it, it, you, let, me, let me back up. If we didn't have this verse right here, Ephesians 5.31, which is a quote from the book of Genesis, that the two will become one, a man will leave his father and his mother, and the two will become one. If we did not have that mystery that really was revealed all the way back from the Garden of Eden, if we didn't have that, we would never, we would never have pictured two to become one. We always would have pictured two who are two. They happen to own, you know, own some property together, and they live in the same house, and they have a, you know, they share a car, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, two people with one car, two people with one house, two people with one bed, two people with one, all these. But we would say, yeah, two, two is two. That's what two is. Two is two is two. But here it is revealed to us in Scripture that two shall be one. This is a great mystery. Now I think that. Uh, that it is a wonderful mystery, by the way, of two becoming one. When I, uh, when I conduct a wedding, officiate at a wedding, uh, the, uh, bride, uh, the, the, the bride and the groom, they come forward, they stand uh, before me, and, uh, you know, uh, I now pronounce you husband and wife, but usually right before I pronounce them husband and wife, I, by the way, I no longer say, by the authority of the state of whatever I am. Because I figure, the state doesn't really own marriage. They don't authorize me. Uh, I can do it without them. But that's just the rebel in me. Now going on, <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in there. Now going on, uh, so I usually say, as a minister of the gospel, I now pronounce you husband and wife. But right before that, I talk about how, hey, you know, you, you two are coming together and you've got two pasts. There's two of you, and in a sense, you're going to go out this aisle over here with two of you, and uh, you're going to uh, live, you know, with uh, two ways of putting the toilet paper over and two ways of squeezing the t toothbrush and all that, uh, but spiritually, you two are going out as one. And then I'll say something like, this is not something that the state can do for you. You file this marriage with the state, but they don't make two one. That's just for tax purposes. Now, uh, sometimes I'm nicer and more formal in the wedding. Uh, then I'll say, I, as a minister of the gospel, I can declare it, but I can't really make the two of you one. That's not something that I can do. This is something that God does. Man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. And so typically I'll stop the ceremony right there and say, now, why don't we have a word of prayer and ask God to do his work of making two into one? And then I'll, I'll uh, bow and I'll say, dear Heavenly Father, here's something that uh, this couple desires, something that I can't do, something the state can't do, something the church can't do, but God can do it to make two into one. God, would you perform this miracle right now, this mystery of two? 
two into one. It's this mystery of marriage. Now, obviously, so much more we could say about this if this wasn't an overview sermon, and, uh, and, and if we don't want part three. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, let me say that a lot of people confuse this, mistake this, to be a mystery of the church as the bride of Christ. That's not uh, what this is about. This is a mystery. This is a great mystery of two becoming one. He goes on here to say, this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. This is why people begin to get a little confused here. Uh, because they say, oh, this is, a, this, this is a mystery that says the church is the bride of Christ. It really doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, uh, he, he has interrupted his, his discussion of the church to talk about verse 31 and 32, and then he says, but, right here, uh, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So here's the mystery of two becoming one, but... I want to talk about something else. Nevertheless, let every, every one of you, and so here he, he goes and he begins to uh, talk about uh, uh, these uh, other matters that are uh, right here. So here we have uh, for, for this cause, shall a man, there's the word I'm looking for, the word for right there is the word anti, anti. Um, I remember in the fifth grade at Chelwood Elementary School in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Miss Antonelli was our teacher. She was, she was not the nicest teacher I ever had, in my fifth grade opinion. Uh, and a lot of us didn't like Mrs. Antonelli. Uh, and so, just to be funny, you know, as fifth graders, we used to call her Miss Antismelly. Uh, and of course, she knew this because teachers know all things uh, that uh, go on. And so I remember her telling us uh, one day, uh, I don't care if you call me anti-smelly because that means I don't smell bad. Because anti means not. Uh, not smelly, Miss Not Smelly. Well, we didn't want that, so we quit calling her Miss Anti Smelly. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, that, so since since the, since I was a fifth grade, I have known what anti means. Uh, and anti means, hey, now. I'm substituting something else. Ante literally means the substitute for. So here he has been talking, and then he says, now let's substitute, let's switch, let's talk about this other thing and this great mystery. But I've been talking about Christ and the church, separate things, nevertheless, these separating these things and saying these are not the same thing. So this is a, a, a mystery about two becoming one. Now let's turn for what uh, those of us who are believers in Christ is one of our uh, favorite, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, beginning in verses uh, 13 and going down to verse 18. And I'm calling this the mystery of the dead in Christ. This is one of those that does not use the word mystery, but he says, I would not have you to be ignorant. I want you to know something. And what we discover is the information that's given in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 we can't find anywhere else. We wouldn't know about it if Paul hadn't said it here, if he had not revealed it. Uh, and in fact, just to show it's a revelation, he goes on to say uh, in verse 15, this we say to you, unto you by the word of the Lord. That is, the, here's a revelation I want you to know so that you would not, uh, in verse 13, where are we? In verse 13, so that you would not be ignorant. Now, you know, it's kind of interesting in the very next chapter, and let me just jump down there just a few verses, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, he, he says, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. That is to say, the times and the seasons, that's not a, that's not a mystery I need to reveal to you. That's already known. You can go back and research the times and the seasons, the epics, uh, the uh, dispensations of various things of God. You can go back and read that on your own. I don't need to write that to you. But again, backing up here to verse uh, 13, uh, we have this word that, hey, here's something that you would be ignorant about if you don't know. Here is a mystery. Again, I'm calling it the mystery of the dead in Christ. And so he says what? I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That obviously is a euphemism for dead. 
In fact, he tells us that later uh, on in uh, the uh, verse, uh, down in the verse, I think it's 15, uh, which talks about the dead in Christ. So those who are asleep, they're dead. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and here's the foundational aspect of this particular mystery, somebody's dead and we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... Them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, this reveals some stuff to us. In the Old Testament, uh, we, when, when, a, when a Jew died, they went to a place called Sheol. Sheol was, uh, it, from everything we can tell, it, was, it had uh, paradise within it. It had Abraham's bosom. Uh, it also had a place of torment. We, we know this from the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, and a person in the, in the Old Testament, they didn't die and go to heaven. They weren't presented this gospel that says, hey, you know, if you receive the, uh, the gift that God is offering through the coming Messiah, then if you, if you place your faith in that right now, then you will know that heaven will be your home someday. They, they didn't uh, say in the Old Testament, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. They knew that the body went into the grave, the soul in the Old Testament went to a place called Sheol, and, and it waited there. This is probably where the Catholics get the idea of purgatory, by the way, this sort of waiting. But now Christ has come, died, buried, rose again, and he says those which sleep, having believed that Jesus died and rose again, Jesus will bring with him. How many of you came with someone today? Go ahead and raise your hand if you came with someone. Good. How many of you who came with someone were with them before, before you got here? All of you. Isn't that amazing? That if you came with someone, you were with them. I bring that, that, that utterly obvious point that if they are going to come with Jesus, they must be with Jesus. So this is something that now we know, ah, the dead in Christ, they're going to be with Jesus. He goes on in verse 15, this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, that may be us, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That is, they're going to go first, the dead in Christ. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Here's something we didn't know until Paul told us, and that is that the dead in Christ, their body is here, their soul is there. When he comes back, they're coming with him, their body is going to be resurrected, they will be reunited, and all of us who happen not to be dead along with them, will be caught up, uh, where's the words there, uh, caught up together uh, with, the, uh, with the Lord, and, uh, and here's, here's uh, verse 17, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so uh, we shall ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. And so here we have this information, which again is so important for us to understand because it involves our lives, our future, our loved ones, our, uh, our spiritual predicament, so, uh, so to speak, and, and it's not found in other places. There's a few places like uh, the uh, book of Titus, Titus chapter uh, 2, verse 13, which talks about the blessed hope. Uh, and we say, okay, I'm looking forward to the blessed hope. What we're talking about is this. But I think you would agree with me, if all we had was Titus 2, 13 and the blessed hope, we wouldn't know what that meant. We would be ignorant. So, okay, there's some mysterious blessed hope out there. Now the mystery has been revealed, and we have the mystery of the dead in Christ. Let's keep going, because uh, we have in 2 Thessalonians, uh, we have the, what I'll call the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity. He says, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, And now ye know... What withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? Let's stop right there. Do I say that every sermon? Uh, he who is going to be revealed, it's talking in the context here, it's talking about the Antichrist. And there is something that is withholding 
the Antichrist, not allowing him to be revealed. Let me ask you a logic question. Uh, if, if a man is being held, is he alive? Yeah. You know, he got a hostage situation or something. After, you know, if they, if they kill him, it's... They're not, we wouldn't say they're holding him, uh, you know, holding him hostage. No, we say, well, they killed him. They killed the hostage. If they're being withheld uh, or, or held on to in order that they might be revealed in this time, okay, that, uh, that uh, person is alive. That's why I wrote this little book, uh, by the way, uh, called The Antichrist is Alive Today. It does have a little parenthetical in there. The Antichrist is alive but not well today. He's not doing so well because he's being withheld he can't get out. He can't run free. I also want you to notice something that this, this word right here is what. You know what withholdeth. We would not use that word for a person. We would use that word for a thing. What withholdeth. That is, there's a prison somewhere that is holding him back. Uh, now, goes on to say, Okay, we know what withholdeth him. Uh, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Oh, wait a minute. I, iniquity, that's bad stuff, right? Uh, and the Antichrist, he's, he, he's the, le the future leader of bad stuff. But iniquity's already happening in our world. What's up with that? Uh, if, if, take a premise here. The Antichrist is to the devil what Jesus is to the Father. That is, the Antichrist is the son of Satan. Well, if he's being withheld, why is all this iniquity going on around us? If, if the Antichrist isn't alive and well, working today, why all this iniquity? The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Not waiting for his time, but already it works. Only he who now letteth will let until he who letteth be taken out of the way. Now, earlier we had what withheld, and here we have he who letteth. It's a little bit uh, uh, confusing, but there is something holding the Antichrist today. And there is someone who is letting. He who letteth. Literally, the Greek says, he who lets loose. He, he who doesn't withhold. Now, we almost want to say, oh, well, this is, uh, this is the Lord. The Lord is letting us do what we want to do. But is the Lord ever going to be taken out of the way? No. No can't be talking about the Lord. And furthermore, it's talking about a mystery of iniquity. Why is iniquity at work? Basically, what this uh, says, and uh, I'll be happy to uh, give you a little copy of that book there, if I have enough. Uh, but basically, what that, little, uh, what the, what that uh, passage of Scripture says is, yeah, the Antichrist, he's not running loose, but the devil is the prince of the power of the air, and he's letting. He's letting iniquity work. Why is there so much iniquity today? Blame it on the devil. You know, the devil made me do it, in a sense. There's, there's, a, there's a, some degree of truth there. I wouldn't use it as too much of a crutch, but there's a, a, some degree of truth there that the devil uh, carries these things uh, about. And, but someday the devil will be taken out of the way. Remember that whole uh, verse of Scripture about the, uh, uh, about the mega chain? that the devil is uh, chained up in, he will be taken out of the way, and uh, this will take place, the mystery of iniquity. Now, uh, the next one, and I'm doing these just in biblical chronological order, but these two go together very well. The next one is the mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 16, speaks about this mystery of godliness, and it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Without controversy, that means... Everybody knows this. There's not an argument about it. Great is the mystery of godliness. And then it just says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Again, we could spend, uh, we, we could do a series on each one of these. But uh, the godliness, wouldn't you agree with me? Let's, let's just substitute the word morality. Godliness is morality. It's moral living. 
what's the mystery of moral living? He goes on to say, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles. That, I, I'm going to boil this down really quickly and say the mystery of godliness. That is, anybody want to know how to live a godly life or a righteous life or a moral life? Here's the answer. You've got to believe in God. You've got to believe in God. If you don't believe in God, there's no basis for godliness. Or, or to put it a different way, if you don't believe in God, there's no basis for morality. That is why the more our society or any society gets away from a belief in God, the more immoral they become. If there is no God, there's really nothing to base right and wrong on. I mean, it's just, you know, the whim of the society, the whim of, the, uh, of my mood, whatever it is. And so the mystery of godliness, if someone uh, comes and says, hey, I want to I live a moral life, well, I'll, get, I'll, I'll give you a good start. Start believing in God. That's, uh, that's where you can uh, develop any kind of morality. If a society believes that it needs to have morals, well, again, here it is. You've got to uh, ha- have a belief in God. And those who reject the existence of God are forever going to struggle to define right from wrong. I think that describes our society today, doesn't it? They can't figure out what's right, what's wrong, what's up, what's down. Uh, and, uh, and it doesn't even so much matter that, uh, that, that, that uh, the morality they have created makes no sense at all. We want to have women's rights. I can't tell you what a woman is. These are things that don't go together in any universe, and yet our society has accepted these as, ah, well, you know, we just don't say them on the same day. That's how how we uh, make this work. And and the problem is the, the, the society has given up any kind of transcendent, any kind of outside. Can I can I just be so bold here as to say that for a moral society, you don't even have to believe in the one true God of Abraham. As long as you believe in any God, it will be a moral society. This is why societies that hold to any kind of deity out there live basically within a moral framework. They don't, they don't jump out all over the place. I was thinking uh, the other day that I should talk faster so I finish my sermon. But I was thinking the other day about Tom Cruise. He's been in the news lately. Uh, have you seen the movie? Uh, you know, Tom Cruise has been in show business for, like, you know, since I was a lad. Um, I'm 57, he's 59, which kind of disgusts me, the whole thing. But anyway, uh, so he's, he's been in, you know, let's, let's just say forever, okay? I know, not, not like uh, the rifleman kind of forever, but, uh, but, but for a long time. And on Hollywood basis, he's kind of kept a life of some sort of sanity, He's still going, which is more than you can say for most Hollywood people. Well, he's a Scientologist, deeply into Scientology. And my point is, if you will believe in something, then that that leads to the definition of your morals. It, It it goes there. I would rather have a Again, this is shocking for the Baptist preacher to say, but I would rather have a Scientologist society than I would have an atheist society. And, and you can fill in whatever the blank is you want over there. Now, I'm a Baptist preacher, so I would rather have a uh, Judeo-Christian society, one who believes in the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the mystery of godliness is you better have a God. Let me, let me tell you, unfortunately, history shows this to be true. If you... If you remove the transcendent, then society becomes the determiner of that which is uh, good or bad. But society can't agree on, uh, on that kind of thing. And it's so, so much the whim of the day that eventually the government becomes the god. And the government becomes the determiner of what is moral and what is not moral. But the government can't agree on anything either. Have you noticed that in your life? And so eventually you go in a godless society long enough, you, uh, it, it, 
always a substitute for God will come in. And it ends up coming in as the dictator. A, a dictator will come in and say, I am the one who determines what is right and wrong. So a godless society is an immoral society, but it is also a society that is in a, in a heap of trouble in the future. And I think we just, again, we see this uh, throughout all of the world. Societies that hold to some view of the transcendent live a sense of morality. It may not be the same one that you and I do, but they have some sense of morality that holds things together. The moment you give that up, the mystery of godliness is you can't have a God, you can't have a moral society without God. It's just impossible to do. It won't happen. I think this is why, uh, was it John Adams? I may have my founders mixed up here, but uh, they, they, uh, some of the people ask, uh, I'm going to use John Adams. Uh, some of the people asked John Adams after the uh, declar- excuse me, after the uh, uh, Constitution. So maybe it was J- James Monroe, but it could have been John Adams. He was our second president. Let's let's stick with John Adams. I should just speak confidently, and you would know anyway. So, so they ask uh, they ask uh, the future president Adams, uh, "What kind of government have you created?" And he said, "A republic, if you can keep it." <laughs> Franklin. Well, I don't like Franklin. Let's go Adams. But I think you're right. It, maybe it is Franklin. Yeah, it's a republic if you can keep it. Even Ben Franklin, who uh, rejected Jesus Christ and the deity of Jesus Christ, was nonetheless a deist. He did believe in a transcendent being. And, and he understood that, hey, what we have created requires some kind of belief in a God because it requires us to live moral lives. Uh, it requires us to kind of police ourselves, and uh, that's not going to happen if you if you got uh, this thing. So don't give up the mystery of godliness, um, the uh, the mystery of the seven stars and the seven candlesticks. I'm not even going to go there just due to time, but it's Revelation chapter one verse twenty. And let me tell you, it's the simplest mystery there is. What are the seven stars? What are the seven candlesticks? The seven stars are the seven churches. The seven candlesticks are the angels of the seven churches. Boom. Now, you could research now till kingdom come and never have figured that out if it didn't just tell us. That, that's, that's why it's such a great one to figure out, oh, a mystery is something that you can't research. It's got to be revealed to you. And uh, there's that uh, mystery that is given there. Let's go to the uh, next one. And this is the mystery of God. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. Uh, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that's right at the end of time, when, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared unto his servants the prophets. Now this last part tells you whatever this mystery of God is, which is not defined here, has already been defined. Where would you find the definition of it? Go back to the prophets. And uh, the prophets, I think probably uh, I would put this mystery of God uh, much, very close to the first mystery that we had last week, the mystery of the times of the Gentiles, that there are going to be four kingdoms and then a fifth kingdom is going to, uh, to come that's uh, 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 going to uh, obliterate all of the other kingdoms, that there is going to be a time of trouble in the end, the time of Jacob's trouble, the, the great and terrible day of the Lord, the, the moon will turn to darkness and the, uh, excuse me, the sun will turn to darkness and the moon will turn to blood before the terrible day, the great and terrible day of the Lord. All of this comprehensively is the gospel of God, excuse me, the mystery of God, the mystery of God, which is about to be finished. Now, let's look at one more and we will stop. And that is the mystery Babylon, Revelation uh, chapter 17, verse 5. Upon her forehead, speaks of a woman and a beast here, upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abomination of the earth. Often we just call it Mystery Babylon. Uh, What in the world is Mystery Babylon? There have been so many different uh, takes on what Mystery Babylon is. Uh, probably you wouldn't have to look far to say, well, Mystery Babylon is, uh, 
is uh, uh, it's a reference to the United States. Or some would say, oh, Mystery Babylon, that's the, uh, the Pope and the Catholic Church. Others would say, no, Mystery Babylon, uh, somebody probably would say it's Scientology. Oh, Mystery Babylon, it's, uh, uh, it's Islam. Mystery ba- you know, all these kind of things that this is what Mystery Babylon is. But remember, a mystery, can you search it out? No. Can you, uh, you know, uh, do a really good study of the Word of God and figure out what Mystery Babylon? No, you'll get the wrong thing. You can't do it. It's got to be revealed. So here's Mystery Babylon. If we go down to uh, verse 7, excuse me, 7, there we go. Uh, The angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns, and begins to describe. Now, I, I, I don't know why we do so much research on this, because he says, here's a mystery. I'll tell you what it is. Well, okay, I think I should read what it is. I'm going to skip the verses in between, but we go down to verse 18, as it uh, gives some definition there. But you go down to verse 18 in that same chapter, and what it says, The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Babylon, mystery Babylon, is that great city. I don't think I need to spiritualize city. That just says, I never could have figured this out in my own research, but Babylon is going to be rebuilt. That great city, it's going to exist again. Uh, There's still some prophecies about it that haven't been fulfilled, uh, and uh, they're There's no reason at all that you couldn't rebuild it. We know where it belongs. Uh, We we know where it was. We know where it belongs. There's uh, been a number of attempts down through the ages to rebuild Babylon. No one's been successful at it. But it's going to be rebuilt. And we could learn from 17 and 18 how it's going to be rebuilt as an international cosmopolitan uh, uh, place of commerce. I wouldn't be surprised if in in, in future days... The, re- the rebuilt city of Babylon is not the financial capital of the world. Uh, in fact, I would not also be surprised if it's not an international city, maybe even uh, tax-free. Uh, would you like to move there? Oh, be careful. <laughs> uh, but in the end, it goes back to Babel. This is the city that man built. And uh, man's going to build it again in the end. And God, in the end, is going to destroy it uh, just the same. Mystery Babylon. All of that, then, is uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, mysteries of the Bible that we have looked at uh, here in, uh, I don't know what we got there, 15 or so, uh, mysteries of the Bible that have been revealed. Again, someday we'll go back and we'll uh, look at those and we'll begin to uh, pick them out. But, you know, in the meantime, you're saying, hey, I'd really like to know what God is up to in the world today. Uh, I want to have a biblical worldview. Go back, use that list, find those mysteries, and just take the Word of God for what it says about that and say, okay, here's the, if we could put it this way, here's the building blocks of the world. Here's the things that God has said. These things are going to uh, happen, are happening, are in the works today, and we can use them to interpret all of the world events that take place uh, uh, down through time, figuring out uh, where we are in these various mysteries. So God has done us a great favor when he uh, put something in the Bible that used the Greek word mysterion in a different way than we use, coming into the English, mystery, a different way than we use mystery. And we, we might want to say, Mary and I had this conversation earlier, but it wasn't this conversation, but it was kind of this conversation, wasn't it? We might want to say, you know, why didn't, why didn't it just put it as plain as day? Uh, but that, you know, even going back to the, they say, why do you speak in parables? So that you'd know the mystery. Why don't we just, you know, lay it right out there? Because you've got to study to show thyself approved, a workman who had no need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And God has given us all the building blocks we need to understand our world today. And with that, we're out of time. But let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father. Thank you for your word that uh, reveals so much uh, to us. We're grateful for the, the, uh, the, the, 
the enumeration of these mysteries that's given in the Word of God, and we're grateful that you've given us all the revelation that we need in order to uh, understand all that uh, we should understand in order to build a, uh, a view and an understanding of this world and what God is up to today. That would be a, uh, a joy to us, dear Heavenly Father, and we rejoice in this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the things that's not a mystery is that God was going to send a savior into this world and therein we rejoice because right from the beginning when mankind messed up god said i'll fix it and uh, they began to look for the savior and eventually the savior in the fullness of time god sent forth his son and uh, that savior did come into the world and now eventually it uh, comes to the point where god through that savior uh, through the work of that savior says i'll offer uh, eternal life completeness in Christ to anyone who would receive it, man, woman, boy, or girl. They do it by grace, through faith, not of works. And uh, what, a, what a, uh, uh, a, a blessed revelation that is, not really a mystery, it's a revelation God told us right from the beginning. This is what he was going to do, and that he has done, and we rejoice in it, uh, do we not? And uh, why don't we uh, go out from this place with a little sunshine in your soul? or heavenly sunlight. There we go, stand together, and uh, we'll just be dismissed uh, with the time today. We do have potluck lunch, and would love to see you back there, all of you. We've got plenty of